Hello, I'm Nicholas Dufo, an Associate Professor of Plant Pathology and Extension Specialist here at the University of Florida. Today I'm going to talk to you about corn disease management with a focus on foliar and stem diseases of corn in Florida. And today we're out here at the North Florida Research and Education Center in Mariana and we're going to talk to you about corn diseases, some common corn diseases in Florida, what to look for in those diseases, as well as what we can do for management of those corn diseases. My goals for this presentation are to stress the importance of proper diagnosis, plant resistance, and the judicial use of fungicides when developing a disease management program. At the end of this presentation, I'll discuss a look-alike disease problem that you may face and provide you with some excellent resources related to corn disease management. Management of any pest or pathogen problem starts with proper and correct diagnosis. This slide provides you with information about our local extension offices found throughout the state of Florida and the locations of our plant diagnostic labs. As you can see, there are six UF diagnostics labs available throughout the state of Florida. These labs typically provide feedback about plant disease issues. However, nematode, insect, and nutrient issues can also be identified in these labs. For more information about each of these resources, click on the web links provided. All in-season management programs should be supported by scouting. Otherwise, it's possible you'll get caught on the pivot with nowhere to go. Scouting should be done year round, but often can wait until the corn reaches the V6 growth stage. This is the six collar leaf stage of corn. In my next four slides, I will cover initial diagnostics of common corn disease issues. But keep in mind, there are many corn diseases and the symptoms of these diseases will vary in relation to the environment and the corn variety. It is not uncommon to see rust diseases develop on corn, but knowing which rust disease is present can determine if treatment is needed. Common rust does not typically require a treatment with the current hybrids available. However, southern rust can, as this disease can move quickly through the corn canopy leading to rapid defoliation and heavy late season lodging. It is possible to produce a confident diagnosis of rust in the field, but remember the color differences can be hard to tell in a field setting. Southern rust is typically only visible on the top side of a leaf and is more orange in color. Common rust on the other hand occurs on the bottom and top side of the leaf with spores having a dark brown color to them. Even though it is called northern corn leaf blight, this disease is very common in the south. The pathogen of this disease survives between seasons on corn residue, which means a majority of its inoculum comes from the ground. Rotations of two to three years away from corn and tillage can help limit this disease. Both methods reduce the pathogen by leaving it in environments where it is outcompeted by other microbes. Tillage, more specifically, can help by incorporating residue into the soil, thus reducing the amount of pathogen present through destruction of its food source, the corn debris, and by placing it in an environment, the soil, where there are more microbes that can outcompete it. The lesions, considered cigar-shaped as seen in the figure on the slide, of northern corn leaf blight are often diagnostic for this disease, but spores, also seen above on the slide, are often easy to find just after a few hours of moisture. Don't ignore the small spots or blights on your corn leaves. They can have significant impacts on yields too, especially on susceptible hybrids. Many of these spots and blights can be confused in the field. This means pathogen identification in the lab is needed which can be done with the help of your local extension agent. So when we're out scouting for diseases, we want to also look for stock rots in corn. And this usually happens around V6 to V8 that we want to start going to look for stock rot. But oftentimes we can come in after tasseling to look at stock rots as well. And what we're trying to do is when we're, when we're out there in the field is we want to squeeze these stalks right around the bottom, right around the crown, right next to the soil surface. If they're soft, there's an indication that a pathogen is inside that stalk. Once we have that indication of a pathogen, we can then pull up that plant, cut it open, and take a look inside. And generally, stock rots can be caused by uh, fungi, fungi or bacterial pathogens as well. 
And usually the easiest way to tell the difference between the two would be to see pink mycelium inside that stalk or have a really bad smell for bacteria. But usually stalk rots, to get a true identification, you need to take them into a diagnostic center or to your local extension office to make sure you know which pathogen you're dealing with. So I just talked about how you identify stalk rots in the field. What does it look like on the inside? When you cut open a plant, you are looking for the presence of mycelium or soft tissue for stalk rots. The images on this slide show typical signs for fusarium stalk rot and crown rot. You can see the presence of fungal growth in the stalks and pink coloration that is sometimes apparent. More information about crown rots in Florida can be found at the link presented on the slide. Before we consider applying any fungicide, it is important to consider the corn variety's resistance traits. Really, plant resistance is our number one defense for all diseases, including corn. All the companies put out guides on how their varieties respond to diseases. But remember to read the documents carefully and be sure to look over the fine print. Also, check out the UF Field Corn Production Guide for more tips on varietal selection. You can find the link on the slide. It is hard to keep up on all the varieties and traits. Corn variety trials are being conducted around the state for field, silage, and sweet corn. Contact your local extension agent to get more information about varieties that perform well in your area and have the resistance you are interested in for the disease history in your field. All right, so when we're out looking at corn diseases, we always want to think about a threshold for when we're going to spray. And typically that threshold comes with our ear leaf, which you can see right here on this corn plant. So here's your ear of corn and here's the leaf coming off of it. So whenever we get 5% of disease on this leaf or anywhere above that leaf at tassel time, that's usually a trigger for when we want to spray. But one of the most important things when we're thinking about disease management is diagnostics. So we don't just want to go out and spray any fungicide, but we also want to identify the diseases. And I hope to show you some of those slides in my presentation as well. So as I just said, a good threshold is when the ear leaf has disease symptoms covering 5% or more of the leaf. Why is this a good threshold? Well, fungicide sprays made before the ear leaf emerges have a low impact on yield because they protect leaves primarily involved in plant establishment. Sprays made after the ear leaf emerges have a higher impact as they protect the leaves providing energy needed to fill the ear. This is why applications before V8 typically do not lead to yield responses. For example, they do not protect yield producing leaves. And why VT applications provide significant yield responses, they can protect the upper canopy. This means our goal when applying a fungicide is to protect the leaves, providing energy to the ears, which is why we pay attention to the ear leaf and above for our fungicide threshold. Fungicide sprays should be applied when needed for disease. However, spraying too early often leads to a low probability of seeing a return on your investment. Research conducted from Georgia to Quebec, Canada, and many states in between, shows that a single application of a fungicide applied at V6, containing both a DMI and a QOI product, had at best a 50% probability of recovering the product cost for corn valued at $5 per bushel and a product cost of about $14 per acre. This same scenario for a single fungicide applied at VT had a 75% probability of recovering the product cost and a greater than 50% probability for corn valued at $2 a bushel. The data on this slide shows that we have similar trends here in Florida from trials conducted in 2016. Knowing when to spray a fungicide can often be very difficult. However, sprays at V6 often do not provide us a return on investment. And more information about that can be found at the link in the, the notes section of this slide. What does this mean? It basically means that most growers will not need a spray until VT or when the tassel appears on the corn. However, even though VT is the optimal timing, we do know that many situations and many varieties vary in their disease susceptibility and the environment can change 
how quickly a disease can move or spread through the plant canopy. Thus, sprays between V8 and R1 can be very beneficial and often can lead to that return on investment. There are a lot of there's a lot of information that goes into selecting a fungicide spray, uh, but however, our timing of our sprays and applying it when we can protect the best part of our canopy is often the most crucial. So there are many things to consider when applying a fungicide for corn disease management. On this slide, I list six common things to know or consider when assessing your risk. These are, is the disease present locally? If it is, that should increase your risk. Know your variety susceptibility. How does the susceptibility change your perception of risk? If it's more susceptible, you should also increase your risk. Also know what the crop or market potential is of your corn. At low market prices, fungicides usually will not provide a return on investment, especially when we have low disease. What was your planting date? What's the growth stage? Anything before V6 has a low probability of return, but anything after that on a high yielding corn could be worthwhile for a fungicide spray. What's the forecasted environment? Will it promote or inhibit disease? If it's going to promote disease, then it's time to consider improve, increasing your risk level and considering a fungicide spray. Also, look at that ear leaf severity threshold, especially at tassel. Is it greater than 5%? Then it's time to seriously consider a fungicide application, especially if we have any of the other categories in high risk as well. So your perception of risk is very important. However, it is important to realize that corn diseases can be devastating and that once you move into any moderate risk category, it is time to seriously consider a fungicide application. There are many options available for corn disease control and they all vary in their ability to control disease. The Crop Protection Network, with the link which you can find on the slide, has an excellent resource available for determining which program to use with your specific disease situation. If you are considering only one application in a season, then a mixed mode of action product should be strongly considered as they typically provide the highest probability for a return on your investment. While there are many diseases that impact corn each year, there are also many environmental and spray injury symptoms that can mimic disease. One specific case I want to talk about is paraquat burn. This burn can closely resemble eye spot of corn, which you can see in the images above. Some key differences though are one, paraquat burn is typically only on the older leaves, where disease will spread throughout the canopy of the plant. Two, eye spot will typically have halos present and paraquat burn will not. In three, paraquat injury generally occurs within one day of application. Disease on the other hand will develop over time, at least a couple of weeks, if not more. However, paraquat burn can cause extreme spotting up the plant, as seen in the image on the slide, and can lead to severe blighting under certain environmental conditions, as seen as the image on the right on the slide. These situations can make paraquat diagnosis difficult to complete in the field. Due to the complex nature of paraquat burn, it is important to seek help when needed. If you are concerned about whether paraquat burn is present, you can send a sample to a plant diagnostic center to confirm at least the disease is not present on that sample. Also, you'll want to document the injury by looking at the field pattern. Is it the entire field, the near edge, or specific areas that have this burn injury? The timing, when did you see this? Did it occur within a couple of days or did it occur over several weeks out there in the field? Check the weather. Is the weather appropriate for disease? Is it not? Is it appropriate for drift? Photograph your symptoms as best you can. Cell phones do a great job, but if you do have a better camera, it is good to take close-up images of those lesions as well. Determine the extent of the damage. How much of the canopy is damaged? How much of the field is damaged? What's it close to? And what have we seen in the past in this field for disease history and does it resemble that? And keep good farm records. What has been applied recently around your region 
to better understand if you even had a paraquat application close to the field of interest. Once paraquat burn occurs, there's no management available for this problem. Things such as resistance or pesticides will not be a cure for this issue. Thus, this injury can only be assessed and proper diagnosis of this problem is needed if we wish to do further work with it in the future. Remember, you can contact your local extension agent for more information on this issue or any of the disease management topics I discussed here today.